Good evening and welcome to another episode of Across the Pond. This week I am in a new location. I know my face is pink. Teething problems, uh, some technical difficulties. But yeah, Barry, how pink do I look that side? You look the exact right shade of pink, Chad. Nothing wrong with a little bit of pink, especially with the pink day that just happened uh, yesterday. So uh, excited to get this going and the lighting doesn't matter as much as your insights, Chad. So looking forward to hearing from you today. Well, in case you're wondering, I did not put fake tan all over my body. So that's the only thing that we need to know. Let's get into our episode. Welcome back to Across the Pond. As we said, this is episode 14. We've not missed a week yet. And uh, yeah, I think this week we're actually approaching a decent length in terms of what we've got on the bill. What do you think, Barry? Yeah, it's so hard to judge how much time we're going to take on these topics. So we, we, we're trying to get there, guys. We, we're going back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> trying to get to that magical one-hour mark um, and trying not to take on too much. So we'll see what happens today. Um, but lots of good stuff on the, on the cards. So I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. Let's get into it. The week that was... Alrighty, so let's look back on this week that was. Uh, first item up on our list is something I actually knew nothing about but heard um, coming across where basically a potential HIV vaccine in South Africa has now been ruled ineffective. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. There was a vaccine in Thailand that has been proven effective to rule out a couple of strains, but it looks like the common strains in South Africa are a bit more resilient to this type of methodology. And so this trial of more than 5,000 people in South Africa has now been scrapped and essentially back to the drawing board. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think it's an important result, even though it, it's not a it's not a happy one. In a sense, we were hoping this was going to deliver some new some new results. And obviously, they've been trying to find ways of of, of curbing the HIV and AIDS and kind of looking looking for vaccines and whatnot. Because uh, at, at the moment, the only medical like way you can handle it is kind of managing the, the virus or managing the disease, as opposed to getting rid of it completely. Yeah. And so, this potential vaccine was was an, an exciting opportunity. Um, unfortunately, it has been proven uh, not ineffective, basically, and so we're going to go back to the drawing board, like you say. I think why it's interesting to talk about is the fact that we don't often hear about when these science experiments, when they find nothing, right? When there's like a non-result or something goes against what was hypothesized, we often don't hear about it. We only kind of hear about the things that are changing things or the new information that comes across the board. Yep. And so it can be a little bit um, misaligned with how science actually works. Like there's 99 of these types of results before you get the one that actually makes the difference, right? So it's nice hearing about one of these things where they're trying a new new vaccine, uh, trying it on I think 5,000 patients in South Africa yeah. and testing it and seeing what kind of effect it has and unfortunately it just doesn't seem to have the effect that we want. But it's a, it's a good sign that science is working the way it should and that these kind of results are necessary to get to the right solution in the end. Now I might be completely off whack here but um, from what I know about the virus this was a virus that crossed over from the animal kingdom as well uh, similar to the coronavirus like we've been chatting about obviously completely different um, you know in its all forms and, and I'm not a medically qualified person to, to chat about this but uh, my understanding is this was one of those and uh, it's still however many years down the line we don't have a solution for it. Bit of a scary thought. Yeah, definitely. It, it's been the it's been the, the the lead killer in a lot of, a lot of Africa, right? Besides malaria, and it's been kind of the virus that's um, typified this generation of people. It's kind of the virus that I identify with most in the sense of what kind of impact it's had on the continent. Yeah. And obviously, like we we, we, ch we chatted about Thailand, and it kind of worked in Thailand, but Thailand's such a small portion of the AIDS epidemic around the world, like so much of the AIDS epidemic is in Africa itself. And so there's obviously genetic differences between the patients across the across the sea. And that's potentially why these these things don't kind of translate to cross borders. Uh, but HIV and AIDS is still a huge killer. At one stage, it looked like it was going to be a giant pandemic that was going to wipe out a yeah. lot of people. So we've made huge strides to actually control it and bring it to a manageable level where people can live long lives of yep. decent health while having the virus, but it's still a major killer. And for a lot of people who can't afford the antiretrovirals, it still is a, a serious, serious issue. So it's something we haven't solved yet. Um, I'm hoping that we find, keep finding solutions, we keep working on it, uh, because it is one of those huge viruses that are so important to us. 
Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think, like you said, now people are actually able to still live long, meaningful lives. I actually saw an article um, in the Men's Health a few months ago where one of the leading Wales rugby players actually came out and sort of, you know, uh, announced that he has it um, and, yeah, is is living a healthy life, which is something that obviously wasn't possible when this was first discovered. Um, obviously, some strides have been made there, but but more to come. Um, does this sort of worry you about, uh, you know, the coronavirus and, and uh, potentially not being able to find a vaccine for this this might be us talking in you know 40 years time with a similar story yeah i I think i think the nature of these things is that they keep evolving and they keep manipulating themselves and they keep changing right to to react to whatever medical um implications we put in place whether it comes to antibiotics or becomes vaccines and whatnot and these viruses just want to survive so they'll do anything to evolve into something new so I don't think we're ever going to get to a stage where we can kill off everything, right? There's always going to be new viruses on the on, on the cards, and we have to keep evolving, keep changing our medicine to interact with the organisms that are living on the planet at that time. So it's it's a battle. You're never going to win fully. You just have to keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. But the strides that modern medicine have taken over the last 100 years fill me with confidence yep. that we really are on top of this thing. And we know exactly what's going on. Our, our quarantines are getting better. Our global cooperation is getting better. And so hopefully we're getting better at managing these types of spreads and these types of viruses, um, which is a contrast to the fact that we're living so much closer to each other than we used to. And so in the major cities, there's even bigger risks for these sorts of viruses to, to, to kind of take over. So, yeah, with coronavirus, I'm still hopeful that we're going we're gonna to eliminate it completely. But there'll be another one, and there'll be another sure. one after that. So we have to keep thinking about how do we get ahead of the curve and how do we keep not, not get complacent and keep vigilant about making sure we understand what's going on and uh, push our, our medical community to keep finding solutions for us. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, sort of medical community aside, I think even just the the sharing of information is quite an important one on this front, especially in the case of HIV and AIDS, where, as you said, a lot of Africa um, has been you know, wiped out by this uh, virus. And a lot of the time, access to information, a bit of a tricky one there. So let's hope some of that medical uh, information and medical research actually uh, starts getting a bit further in the future. The next story is uh, the ex-president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, and I saw a an arrest warrant being put out for him. And as soon as I saw this, I instantly sent Barry a quick message, uh, you know, very excited about this, this news. I don't know how it would have sort of slipped past. Um, but there was a very clear little asterisk there that I missed out myself. And that is that this arrest warrant actually only kicks in at a future date. So in terms of a bit of context, it was the pre-trial uh, date for uh, Jacob Zuma. He's facing many, many counts of um, of fraud and money laundering and those kinds of things. Um, and he actually didn't uh, pitch up to this pre-trial. And instead, his representation brought through a doctor's note. The authenticity of this doctor's note has been questioned uh, quite a bit. I believe it didn't even have a date on it. Um, and so for this reason, uh, the magistrate put together an arrest warrant that when this trial actually starts, if he doesn't rock up, this will become effective. Quite a bold move. It looks like we're going to see Jacob Zuma have his day in court. Yeah, it's it's a really big deal for the country because after all the state capture things we've dealt with the last couple of years, nothing's really happened, right? We haven't seen anyone go to jail. We haven't seen any big kind of ramifications for people who were part of all of this corruption. And so Jacob Zuma, as the kingpin, was seriously involved in a lot of it. And so a lot of South Africans are hoping that he's going to see some sort of retribution. We're going to see some sort of justice um, put down on him. But it's just taking so long, right? We feel yeah. like it's taking forever. And so the, the date keeps getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. So this was the, uh, when you sent me the message, I was very, I was ready for the, the, the mobs to go and grab him and like ready yeah. to, I was on news straight away trying to find out what was going on. Um, but unfortunately, it was not nearly as dramatic as I was hoping for. Yeah. Um, but we will, we will see. Uh, it's hard to tell with these sorts of things as to whether he's legit, whether it's legit or not, right? Maybe he is sick and maybe he is unable to, to go. I mean, he is an old man if we think about sure. it that way. But but it's it's super convenient, right? And so th- all the conspiracy theories will come out that he's left the country and he just doesn't want to stand trial at all. And he's going to try and run for the rest of his life. And so that's the concern: is that can we actually bring him to a fair trial and get a sense of what actually happened, and can we get some sort of justice, whatever that looks like? Um, so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Yeah, I mean, this one's an interesting one for anyone sort of not in South Africa, anyone who hasn't been exposed to this. Um, I I think it's definitely worth uh, giving a little bit more context. So I believe a lot of these 
charges are related to this arms deal where a large number of irregular payments uh, were made to him or he sort of received uh, these types of payments as part of this arms deal. Um, we know Shabir Sheikh uh, has been sent to prison uh, it related to this. And uh, I mean, Jacob Zuma has just been dodging, um, obviously, while he was president, able to, you know, very easily kind of maneuver these uh, claims and, and, and sort of just dodge spending time in court. But uh, I mean, yeah, like I said, it looks like this day is finally coming. Is there anything else you'd like to fill in some of our other listeners about? Um, I, I think I think the key thing for me is is what impacts this kind of investigation has on the state of South Africa in the minds of overseas investors, right? So if we, we spoke about the World Economic Forum a, a few episodes ago, and we're chatting about the fact that if South Africa can show that they've got a judicial system that works and that can then like implement the right kind of justice on this kind of issue, it might restore a little bit of faith in the country and its institutions Definitely. that things actually there's actually consequences for actions, right? But if it doesn't go that way, and if, if Jacob Zuma gets away with it, and kind of we move on with life and we forget about what happened, all that state capture and all that corruption goes goes begging. Yep. Then then it's a worry, right? Because then it kind of shows that this you can get away with this stuff. And so for, for, for people outside of South Africa, I think it's important that they, they realize how important this is for this, the country's reputation. And regardless of what you think of Jacob Zuma, if you like him or hate him, and regardless of whether he's guilty or not, we want to see a fair trial with lots of evidence and like a real rigorous process to figure yeah. out what to do about the situation. Because that corruption really set our country back 10, 15 years, I would argue. Um, the amount of money that was embezzled and the amount of money in these arms deals was just staggering. Yeah. Um, and when you look at a country with huge unemployment, lots and lots of poverty, that money is, was desperately needed and it just got siphoned into private pockets. And so it's important that we really give a rigorous process on this we figure out as best we can what the the actual truth is at the bottom of the matter yeah. and we show the rest of the world that our institutions especially our law system is working effectively and efficiently and yeah. therefore have some trust back into the country Absolutely. I mean, what is a law system if it's not enforced and uh, no one is actually held to account? Um, you know, you've got people who are able to literally do whatever they please and just have no accountability for it. So hopefully we'll see that day soon. Moving on to the next one. Uh, this one was quite a staggering story. I actually just came across it and, and Barry and I were just chatting a little bit before our episode at uh, how it was even possible that this even happened. So two Franco-Israeli men have been accused of impersonating the French minister, and uh, they're on trial now for fraud. Um, so essentially what happened is is these two guys sent out, I believe, videos which were, um, you know, using a mask, as far as I, I, I've heard, from of this French minister. And they actually sent it to representatives of countries around the world asking for money, um, saying that, you know, the country is in a, a dire straits, the country needs money for whatever purpose. Um, and that, you know, couldn't be released to the press for whatever the reasons. And they have actually been able to get $69 million um, from, from two individuals. Absolutely crazy. Yeah, it's, 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 I can't quite believe it. It feels like a movie of, of some <laughs> sense. It wasn't just videos. They actually did Skype calls as well. Right. So these guys must be amazing actors and were able to put on like all the accents and like make it look like it really was the, the defense minister of France. And uh, they targeted, I think, upwards of 150 different people that they thought they could maybe get some money out of. And uh, basically we said to them, listen, we, d we need money for, for I think, think for, for, for ransom payments and then also for anti-terror type yes. of stuff. Yes. And then saying, don't worry, the French government will repay you. We're, just, we're in a bit of a cash flow crunch at the moment. Yeah. We need that money in as soon as possible. <laughs> it's just a bit crazy that these two guys can just like find these targets, dress up <laughs> as this minister, and That's then crazy. try and get them to send money. And so obviously uh, the vast majority obviously saw through the ruse and thought it was a bit strange, but all you need is one or two, right? And so they got these two people. The one person uh, sent through $20 million, the other $49 million. And so they walked away with $69 million, which is it's just a crazy story um, and quite comical in some way. Um, and this, this, this happened back in 2015, so it's only now coming to trial. So now we're going to get to hear exactly what both sides of the story look like and what, what they say and what they claim. They're both denying both charges, so it's right. been interesting to see <laughs> what happens there. Um, but it's just a very, very weird story. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one to, to see how it, how it maps out, especially if they're denying the claims. I mean, if it happened on an 
infrastructure like Skype. I'm not entirely sure whether that footage would still be held. Um, it would be really interesting to see also because of the fact that it would be a defense minister. Um, and I, I'm not even sure how they got the details of the relevant uh, other counterparts in, in the other countries, but presumably there'd be some sort of encryption or some sort of other ways of securing the channel of communication. And so I don't even know whether that type of feed would be recoverable anymore. That would be interesting to see. But let's see whether they can recover those funds. Um, do you think it's already been scattered across the globe? Or do you think there's potentially still money to recover? Yeah, I'm sure the money's definitely gone from the account it was in, right? So the question is whether they can recover it from wherever it's gone yeah. or are these guys going to have to go to jail and repay over time? I, I'm not quite sure. I, I think what's more, like the money is not as important. Like $69 million sure. sounds like a lot for an individual, but for the French government, it's like nothing. But it's the principle that the fact that your one of your, one of your high level ministers could be scammed like that is, is a bit embarrassing for the French government. Definitely. So I think more so than the money, it's about just writing that kind of principle um, and just like kind of reminding us how, how vulnerable we all are to things like phishing, to things like scams, to identity theft, etc. Because we just kind of take people at their word often. We, d we, don't, we don't do the kind of security checks we should be doing on these sorts of important things. And I think we've all been scammed at some point in our life, right? We've all, been, we've all got caught in one of these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully in your one, you haven't sent $49 million of your money <laughs> to someone else. Hopefully not. Um, I mean, who would have actually thought that government type communication systems needed a Twitter or Instagram like blue tick next to names. Really interesting thought that. <laughs> Moving on to the next one, uh, this one actually affecting my side of the pond. So this past weekend, uh, we actually were hit with a storm, storm Ciara. And uh, I don't know if it's Ciara or Kiara or something like that, but essentially over this weekend, we had gust winds of, I believe, up to sort of 80 miles an hour. Um, and I, we, we kind of just stayed indoors um, while watching some crazy things unfold outside. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially what I heard this morning was that a US to London flight has actually broke the record of the fastest flight um, because they were kind of, they had a nice tail, tailwind to push them along. And they were actually one full hour quicker than previously um, due to this tailwind. Um, and yeah, as far as I know, we're talking about a sort of four or so hour flight. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at kind of maybe a five or six hour flight being done in, in four or something, somewhere around there, quite a crazy feat. Yeah, that is crazy. It, it kind of reminds you that the, the speed of an airplane doesn't really matter about the size and the fuel and all that kind of stuff. It often comes down to the wind or comes down to the atmospheric pressure and various other things that aeronautical engineers will understand that whether we don't. Um, yeah. But it's it's amazing that it can speed up that much. I mean, I'm sure the speed was incredible. I wonder how the turbulence was. I imagine that would be quite scary. Um, I would imagine if you're in that kind of wind, especially if the storm, like you say, it might have been a bit of a, a rough and bumpy flight, even though you got there an hour earlier. Well, this is the interesting one, Barry. I actually heard of a podcast where they had actually interviewed a couple of the passengers after the flight, directly after the flight. And uh, it was a complete surprise to people when they started looking at their watches and saw what's actually going on um, to find out that they were part of a world record kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, that type of reaction for me uh, dictates that it couldn't have been too bad a flight. So um, very lucky, I would think, um, especially when the storm today actually, um, today being Monday, um, has actually killed a person, um, a driver, a car driver, um, by a falling tree. Um, so certainly a serious storm. And uh, yeah, I mean, very lucky that the, the people in the plane actually were able to contain it and really obviously didn't change the experience too much. Just in terms of a wider discussion about, um, you know, these kinds of natural disasters or these natural type um, storms. We've seen quite a few in the last, let's say, six months. What's going on in the world? Yeah, so I think I think the answer has to be climate change, right? So that's that 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 is that is the key thing that we that we think that scientists think is behind all of this change, yeah. um, and it's it's kind of that misconception that global warming just means things getting warmer, right? So there's a misconception that a lot of people would just think that's the case, and th the temperature is a big part of it, and that's kind of one of the key aspects that comes with increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But yeah. the, the other other side effects are all of these things just get more and more extreme. So floods get more extreme, colds get more extreme, warm gets more extreme, winds and, and fires and earthquakes and all this stuff, just because the earth is dealing with a brand new change of environment or change in atmosphere. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think a lot of this has come from climate change. And so 
we have to be thinking carefully about the long-term future of our planets because if you kind of forecast all of these things further and further and further to our children, our grandchildren, there's serious concerns here. And so with all the doom and gloom around climate change, there needs to be practical solutions put in place so that these storms don't keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. 100%. And certainly, I think at least that we can contain the, the sort of effects of it. Um, so in this case, obviously, the, the weather predictors were able to spot this coming. Um, and so I sort of saw things flying across Facebook saying that, um, you know, London, we're going to close some of the royal parks over the weekend. I um, mean, all of those types of precautions and uh, and really just messaging that tries to kind of just make sure that all of the civilians uh, are safe and, and, you know, no extra sort of harm is had. But certainly not every base can be covered. On to the next one. We spoke about the BAFTAs last week and the lack of diversity. Uh, we had a little discussion about 2020 Oscars that was then to be upcoming. Barry, talk us through what happened. Yeah, so the Oscars were at the time of recording last night, and so there were a lot of a lot of debate around who won and who should have won, and all the various predictions and whatnot. Um, and so I thought I'd pull out some some key aspects that people are talking about. It was a re- it was it was a relatively um, drama free Oscars, which right. was quite surprising, right? We've had we've had a few of these award ceremonies in the last two or three years that have been full of drama for various reasons, and this was a relatively calm and and composed <laughs> show, which was good to see. Um, I think the I think the biggest thing for me was um, there's been a lot of discussion about the the infiltration of streaming platforms like Netflix into kind of film more generally, and uh, in the past Netflix was seen as kind of a Aside, a stepbrother to traditional movies that like big Hollywood blockbusters and whatnot. Yeah. But with Netflix's continued growth and continued demand and kind of the amount of money they're pumping into original creations, they are now starting to compete with the major production franchises and production companies to get things like Oscars. And so in this particular awards, they were very strong in the nominations. They had 24 nominations for Netflix original uh, pieces of, of film, wow. which was a huge amount. But the surprising thing was they only won two of those 24. And so there's a bit of speculation here about the, who are the people voting for these Oscars and has there been a bias against Netflix because the traditional type of society or traditional academy is obviously quite threatened by Netflix because they are starting okay. to take up a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the budgets and some of the big stars are moving across. And it's a, it's a very interesting debate as to w- the impact Netflix is having on traditional film. And so winning two out of 24 wasn't good for them. Um, it, it, and I, I read an interview with their CEO. They were quite disappointed, actually, because this was a quite a key moment for them to try and prove that they can compete with the best in the world when it comes to their original movies and also to try and draw some of the big stars and the big directors and whatnot. You need to be able to say to them, listen, there's an Oscar in this for you. Um, and if you're not winning Oscars from Netflix, then unfortunately you can't say that. Um, so that was quite interesting. What do you think about that, Chad? We've spoken about Netflix in the past, and uh, two out of 24, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, certainly disappointing. Um, I don't know if this was a Netflix original, but uh, I saw The Irishman, which was on Netflix, um, received 11 nominations, but no awards. Um, so yeah, certainly, certainly tricky. Was that a Netflix original? Do you know? It was, it was. So the, the, the kind of the three biggest movies for Netflix for this year was The Irishman, where you say with Eleven, yeah. then there was The Two Popes, and then there was Marriage Story. Sure. Those are kind of the three, the three key ones that the Netflix were putting together, and that's, what the, that's where the majority of the 24 came from. And Marriage Story was the only one that won for supporting actor, actress, sorry, and then they won one for production design or something like that. So uh, certainly not what they were expecting. Yeah, I mean, really, really interesting. Like you say, I think it's really tricky when you've got a body... Um, you know, that is the Oscars, um, which is dominated, like you say, by the by the film industry. Um, a lot of directors actually not making movies for small screens. Um, and so this is also the other sort of topic is, you know, are those types of films fit for the big screen as well? Um, I mean, I certainly thought they were really high caliber, um, you know, the likes of Marriage Story and the Irishman, which we, we spoke about uh, a couple of weeks back. But yeah, certainly interesting to see how that develops over time. Definitely. The second big piece that I wanted to chat about was um, the major winner of the night. So we're going to get to the awards just now, but the major winner was an amazing film called Parasite, which was a Korean film done in Korean with Korean actors making a comment on Korean class issues 
that um, swept the awards and definitely won Best Picture for, for, for Oscars for 2020. So it's quite, it's very rare that a foreign language film actually wins Best Picture and kind of wins all of these awards. So it's quite a special moment to show that they are, they are open to diversity in this sense and they're not only taking English films, not only taking films made in the kind of small neighborhood of Hollywood. Um, so it was really good to see. And, and I, have, I haven't seen Parasite yet, which I'm very disappointed about, but I've heard such good things from everyone who's seen it and I've read a lot of articles about it and kind of um, reviews and whatnot, and so I believe it's deserved. Though I can't really speak to it until I've actually seen the movie. Have you seen Parasite yet, Chad? I have definitely not seen Parasite, but uh, like you said, I think it's great that this type of award actually just brings something new to the fore. Where all of us now across the globe are going to be wondering, you know, what is it that Parasite has to offer? So we'll, you know, we'll certainly be watching it. Um, the thing for me that I read about, I haven't, I didn't actually watch the Oscars. So if you did, please do weigh in here. Um, but I heard during the acceptance speech. They essentially tried to cut it short by turning the lights off, which was responded to with a whole bunch of boos, to the point that they had to actually just turn the lights back on and, and let the guy finish his speech. Did you watch this, Barry? I didn't watch it, but I mean, we've had this so many times in the past, right? These acceptance speeches are so controversial <laughs> for some reason because people want to talk and talk and talk and talk. And so I can completely understand from the Academy's perspective, you've got like this prime time on TV. You've got, an, yeah. you've got a certain amount of time to get all your awards in and there are so many awards, right? And so many songs and various pieces and whatnot and and you have to keep the schedule going like a German train schedule. <laughs> and so they've got to find a way to cut these speeches short. Otherwise, people will thank everybody, right? So their dog and their dentist and their golf caddy and all that good stuff. Yeah. And so I'm not sure exactly what, what they were referring to. And, and maybe you've got to have some common sense in knowing when the speech needs to be cut or not. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's always difficult because the, the guy who's winning it has... This is life's dream and he wants to like enjoy that moment and he has a right to speak and he wants to chat about various things. But then the poor producer is trying to put on a show and make sure it keeps going on schedule. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely a tricky one. I, I completely get where you're coming from. But, uh, you know, in a case like this where you have somebody breaking new ground from a completely new region with a film that's not even in, you know, the, the sort of main language, um, certainly a few e extra seconds are warranted there. I'm not sure. That's kind of just my take on it. Um, in terms of going through some of the other nominations and awards, actually, um, let, let's have a quick talk through it. So Joker, uh, Jaquin Phoenix, I think I said that the right right now, that I heard Barry <laughs> pronounce it the last time. Um, Renee Zellweger. Don't trust my pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Renee Zellweger for Judy. Uh, Brad Pitt, Once a Time in Hollywood. Laura Dern, Best Supporting Actress for Marriage Story. Um, kind of all the same ones that we were sort of talking about before. Not too many surprises here, I don't think. Yeah, I, I think it was pretty standard and it kind of went to kind of what everyone was thinking. I think that um, the, the Joker was an amazing movie and, and, and yeah. Phoenix was incredible in that. So Best Actor, I think, was deserved. I haven't seen Judy, but I know you mentioned you went to go and see them at Graham Norton. And so I kind of had a little bit invested in that just because of your little story. <laughs> um, so I, I'd have to go and watch Judy. What I was really what I was really glad about was Brad Pitt. I, th I thought he was amazing in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which was Quentin Tarantino's latest movie. Um, I thought it was really good in it. And even though the movie is quite long and quite dense, like Brad Pitt really brought a lot to that role. And so I think it was good to see him winning that. I think that was deserved. Laura Dern was interesting. Um, it was a character in Marriage Story that was a bit shady and no one, mm. no one really liked the character <laughs> because it was a bit of a tough character, but very well played. And I think Laura Dern was fantastic as well. Um, and so those are kind of the, the ones that won all the actors and actresses. Um, so kind of to form, I think. In terms of Brad Pitt, I also read a little bit about his acceptance speech just when you were talking about no drama. Um, I believe he, uh, well, let's actually talk about the speeches. Um, so Brad Pitt, I believe, turned political in his speech. Um, you know, he said he was given 45 seconds for the speech and he said that's 45 seconds more than uh, evidence being presented against Trump was allowed. Um, and so we've seen again, we, we spoke about, uh, you know, Taylor Swift and, and her plea for a bit of a political message uh, a while back. We actually chatted about that last week. And so the same thing happening now for Brad Pitt. Um, if we talk about Jaquin Phoenix, um, he also sort of turned, uh, I wouldn't quite say political, but talking about meat and, uh, you know, more sort of environmental type things. And um, we're definitely seeing speeches pointed to uh, a lot more than just filling up someone's ego these days. 
it's interesting because I wonder what it does to like the viewer who's just who's just a fan of movies and just wants to like revel in yeah. kind of the season of movies. And then people are throwing all of these heavy, heavy issues at you that, to be honest, 45 seconds doesn't do justice to, yeah. right? Even if yeah. you were to try and cover some sort of topic like that, it's hard to do justice to it in that kind of space of time. And uh, also there's a little bit of... There's a little bit of concern here because it's coming from these Hollywood elites, right? And so sometimes it seems a bit patronizing. It seems a bit insensitive. A lot of them aren't in touch with the real issues in the world. Yep. Um, yep. And so, yeah, it's, it's always an interesting one when people use that. Obviously, it's a huge platform and there's millions of people watching around the world. So it's a great opportunity to try and raise awareness for certain things. But I wonder if it's the right place sometimes because, I mean, yep. at the end of the day, it's there to <laughs> celebrate film. It's there to celebrate movies and art. And maybe that's what we should be focusing on in those moments. I don't know what you think, Chad. Yeah, I completely agree. It's completely out of context, I'd say. I mean, if you took somebody like Brad Pitt, uh, if he just took out his cell phone, for instance, and recorded a two-minute video with whatever it is that he's passionate about, put it up on YouTube, between you and I, I mean, I think that would go viral fairly quickly. So, you know, why is it that that platform is used as opposed to one where, you know, we now have the tools to spark our messages out to the world and somebody with a big following like Brad Pitt will get those views anyway. Definitely. And, and it kind of calls to mind a psychological concept of virtue signaling, which is the idea that I'm going to prove to you that I'm a better person than you. And the way I'm going to prove it is I'm going to show you my outrage at a very obviously bad thing. Yep. And, and therefore, that kind of puts me in a, on a moral high ground, right? And so this kind of virtue signaling we've seen all over social media. A lot of people do it. We've, we've spoken about social media activism in the past where you put that video up and you think that's your job done, right? And that's kind of it. And so I think, I think a lot of this is virtue signaling. So yep. while the intentions might be in the right place and it might be coming from a good place, I think these guys have to realize how out of touch with the real world they actually are. And I understand they, they grow up in this world and they've been famous for so long, they probably have no idea. Um, but they're, they're really out of touch with the rest of the world. And so some of these comments, even if they're well-intentioned, they come off yep. a bit sour sometimes. Yep, yep, definitely see where you're coming from there. Really interesting one. Let's move on to our next segment. Stuff I found interesting. All right, so on the stuff I found interesting this week, we've got two topics, um, both of which I think are quite interesting. So the first one was an interview that I listened to on the Joe Rogan Experience, which is one of the biggest podcasts in the world. And uh, what Joe Rogan does, he has a wide range of people on his, on his podcast from every kind of walk of life and lots and lots of different kind of um, places and, and occupations and people and whatnot. And this particular episode was with a guy called Daryl Davis, who is a musician by trade and kind of a semi-musician, kind of not famous at all, but kind of plays in a lot of bars in the US and has, has made a, a semi-living making music. But what's most important and why, why the story is so, is so powerful is that he is a black man who has single-handedly converted over 200 members of the Ku Klux Klan wow. um, to leave the Klan and change their ideological views. Wow. Right, So when you hear that statement, it sounds crazy and it sounds incredible. Um, and when you listen to, so I listened to just like a three hour conversation with the guy and he sp explains like how he thought about doing this. And it was never kind of a, a life's mission of his. He just kind of found himself in a circumstance where he got to meet with the leader of the, the KKK at that time. Oh. And saw an opportunity to try and make a change. And it's a wonderful conversation. And so I thought I'd recap it to you a little and chat about it a little bit, Chad, as to what it takes to change someone's mind if someone has this ideological view that's obviously horrible. Something like the KKK is a horrible, horrible yep. viewpoint. Um, and so basically what he says was he kind of operated from the, the context of how can you hate me if you don't know me? Right. So the, the idea of the KKK is that they think that that black people and people of color are a different species to white people and are inferior by nature. And therefore, we shouldn't even give them anything. We, sh we should really like hate them in a way. Yeah. And he was confused as a child. Um, why? How you could hate somebody if you didn't know them? How could you hate them just because they look a certain way, because of a certain color of skin, right? And so in order to like, use that concept, he decided that if he got to know these people, they wouldn't hate him because they'd find out he's a good guy, he's decent, he's, he's wealth-read, he's kind of intelligent and all these things, and maybe he could change minds by getting to know them. So instead of going under this like defensive mindset of like fighting this, this hypocrisy and fighting this injustice and trying to fight against this kind of ide ideological viewpoint, he tried to make friends with these people. 
right. and like genuine friends. So he went through a process of making friends with these guys over a period of years. So for example, the leader of the clan who he convinced to leave the clan uh, about I think six or seven years ago, it took him like eight or nine years of friendship to wow. change this guy's mind. So how he, how he managed to do it was he kind of tricked him into coming to do an interview with him because he was writing a book on the KKK at the time from a black man's perspective, which was quite interesting. Yep. And um, he convinced them to come and do an interview without telling him he was black. And so the guy arrived at the interview with his bodyguard and walked into the room and then saw the interviewer was black. And uh, kind, of, kind of weaseled his way into the interview and spent two or three hours talking with the guy in a very, very tense situation because obviously yep. it's not a good look for if you're in the KKK and you're talking to a black person, right? Sure. Um, but over that time, he somehow managed to melt this guy or kind of just kind of give this guy an insight that, hold on, maybe these views that I have, which are informed by... Lots of propaganda and lots of like misreadings of the Bible and lots of literal interpretations of various things. Maybe these viewpoints that I have have some chinks in the armor. Yeah. And and what's important from Daryl Davis' perspective is that he didn't judge the guy. He didn't go in there with judgment. He didn't. He, he, all he was trying to do was understand why this guy thought the way that he thought. And once he started digging in without judgment and spent hours and hours and hours with this guy. They became semi-friends and started visiting each other in each other's homes. And, and the guy would wow. come to watch his music performance. And, and eventually he started bringing KKK members to the music performances because he wanted to. S he was an amazing pianist and he wanted the guys to see him play piano. And broke these guys down like day by day, year by year, spending years of his life converting a small number of people. It's just a crazy, crazy story. Um, and it kind of it speaks to the power of just seeing another human being for what they are, a human being with kind of flaws and insecurities and viewpoints that aren't their own, that they've been given as they grow up, etc., and actually getting to know them as a friend and trying to change their mind through example rather than trying to argue with them. What do you think, Chad? It's an absolutely fascinating story, and, uh, you know, I'm so glad to, to hear about this. Um, you know, as you said, it doesn't look like he sort of set out to do this as his life's work but i mean ultimately this is a massive feat and to to sort of take somebody down who who was the leader of the kkk who's now you know one of his best friends is is a is a wildly incredible feat i think the the long investment that went into this is also something that's really important something that we need to to think about often we you know kind of try with it with one interaction or two interactions and kind of give up straight away and it's that sort of level of persistence um, that is required to to build a connection with a person. And, and he's obviously taken that long game over here, which I think is fascinating. I don't know too much about the organization at the moment. Is the organization still going strong? I kind of had the idea that it was something, you know, that happened way back in the past. Um, is, is this still a fully fledged, fully functioning organization today? Yeah, so it's, it, that's a very debatable one. No one really knows because they don't operate under the KKK anymore because obviously there's the stigma and the connotations of it are so terrible that they've kind of split into various splinter organizations all around the world and they are very, very small as far as we can tell. Right. At the end of the American Civil War, when they were at their strongest, they were at about 8 million members, which at the sure. time was a huge proportion of America, right? It was a huge, huge organization and it's dwindled over time and at the moment, our best estimates are somewhere in the tens of thousands, Right? So it's much, much smaller than it used to be. But what's important about it is that it still represents an ideal that we want to extinguish from the world. Right? It represents a principle and kind of a way of thinking that we want to get rid of. And so this 200 is actually a huge number in proportion to what's left in the organization. Right? Yep. And the fact that he did it to someone as a leader, like, and they've got all these weird names for leaders like dragons and wizards and all these weird and wonderful things. It's the fact that he got the, to the leadership perspective really does like, try and cripple this organization. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is dwindling, but they're still out there. And so it's important that we have these kind of conversations and important that we keep fighting this good battle. I, I, I couldn't help thinking about the parallels with South Africa when I was listening yep. to this conversation, right? Yep. Because in South Africa, we have our own racial dynamics and we've had our own history and whatnot. And uh, often we try and solve the perils and the, what ha the implications of apartheid. We want to solve it now. We want to solve it in the next month or in the next year. Definitely. And what happens then is people start shouting at each other and get defensive and therefore we don't have civil discourse. I think what's so important about this story and about what happened in this is that civil discourse is what changes minds. 
You have to yep. build rapport with someone before you can change their mind. They have to like you. Otherwise, why are they going to listen to you, right? If, I, if, if you come and be rude to me about something I hold, hold very personal and it really means a lot to me, if you're rude to me about it, I shut off completely. And Definitely. all of a sudden, I'm not listening to you, right? Definitely. I want to fight you. If, if you come and you actually genuinely want to understand my viewpoint, understand why, the w why I think the way I think, then you might have a chance of changing my mind because you can start to help me point out flaws in my own behavior. Right, so it's not you changing my mind; it's you helping me to change my mind. Does it make sense? It makes complete sense, and uh, I drew those same parallels. You know, when you kind of mentioned that, it's it's something that's still very prevalent. Um, we, you know, you and I, Barry, grew up in the, uh, for all intents and purposes, post-apartheid era, but it's something that's still very, very much there. It's very deeply rooted, and uh, you know, justifiably so, I'd say, for, for for a lot of that that anger that that's still sitting there. Um, but but this is kind of the this is kind of that thing is is we can never have that productive conversation because there is just so much emotion on either side. And uh, what is fascinating about this story is that he came in as you know kind of dropping all sort of anger from his side um, and and starting that dialogue and and really trying to to in a meaningful way um, you know kind of try and get some progress there. Yeah, one last thing I wanted to bring up before we move on is is the fact that one of the interesting side effects of his kind of strategy was his own black friends socially isolated him because they couldn't understand what the hell he was doing, why he was hanging out with these people, right? And so a lot of people were very insulted by the fact that he was hanging out with these people and making friends with these people and whatnot. Sure. And so he actually lived a very lonely life in, in that time part of his life because he was embarked on this journey what he thought was very important and he kind of felt it was one of the most valuable things he could do on this world Definitely. but his black friends couldn't understand it because from their perspective it looked really bad and so not only did he sacrifice that time and all that kind of th all the efforts of building those friendships but he sacrificed a lot of his friends and family as well which was quite horrifying to hear Absolutely. Another interesting thought here is uh, if we look back on our conversation last week in terms of uh, you know ISIS and, and those types of terror organizations where there are these ideological views, do you think this type of approach could maybe um, reap some rewards? I think it always depends on the case by case basis, right? And you always it it's it's not as easy as just walking up to the guy and starting to make friends with him, right? Sure. Because it's just, the world doesn't work like that. I think that where there are opportunities for dialogue, we have to take it seriously, right? So when there, when there is someone who is defected from ISIS or defected from a terror organization and comes into the Western world and we have a chance to change their mind or a chance to understand what's going on behind the scenes, I think it's important that we deal with it with the right amount of care and the right amount of diplomacy. Really. Yep. instead of just shutting them away and like forgetting about it for the rest of the time. Um, and I think it's the principle of understanding that in order to change a mind or change an ideology, you don't do it by shouting, right? Yep. You, you do it by actually engaging with that human being and understanding that in their mind, they're the good guy. That's what we struggle to understand sometimes. In yep. their mind, they are the good guy. And what you're saying is the bad guy. And so we have to be empathetic enough to understand that in their brain, something's not functioning the way that our brain is functioning and the quicker we can figure out what that is the better chance we have of changing it and actually pushing our society forward right so it's not about trying to shut down someone else's idea it's about understanding why do they have that idea and then trying to figure out what the what the right move from there is absolutely well hopefully somebody on his scale will be able to make some changes uh, on that side too moving on to the next one we talk about the bill and melinda gates foundation uh, a foundation that has been you know doing a lot of change in the world and uh, kind of steps in as a uh, sort of mediator between what governments are doing what governments are not doing um, you know obviously a family with a lot of wealth and uh, putting quite a lot back tell us about uh, the developments there this week yeah, definitely. So so they, they've been in the news a lot this week. Um, first of all, because they had an amazing tennis match down in Cape Town yes. with Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal and Trevor Noah and yep. Bill Gates. Uh, so that was a really cool uh, experience. And I wish I was down there. A lot of friends were there. So if you, if you were there, I'd love to hear about it. Um, it looked lots of fun on TV. Um, and basically what they were trying to do was raise awareness for the foundation, right? And so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is, is a huge organization. It's been around 20 years now. And uh, the reason is on the, on the notes today is that they recently released their 2020 letter, which is kind of like their annual letter to shareholders, that kind of idea. And what the letter does, it kind of breaks down what they think their impact was in the previous year and what their plans are for the future. So it's, it's a wonderful read to get a sense of what is Bill Gates and what, what are Bill and Melinda Gates thinking about and how are they looking to, to, to 
deploy all of their money, right? Yeah. So obviously they made a huge amount of money from Microsoft and they are trying to make it as impactful as possible. But they, they intend to give away 99% of it, but they don't just want to give it away for fun. They want to actually make sure it's given to impactful causes that are going to push the world forward. And so in these in the last 20 years, they have spent $53.8 yeah. billion dollars um, for the, on, on their foundation on various things, which is a tremendous amount of money. Sure. Definitely making him the most influential philanthropist of all time, right? There's no one else that spent that kind of money. And uh, they're kind of, they've kind of sure. focused on mostly poor areas. Uh, they have a huge focus on Africa because they really believe that Africa is, is where so much of the suffering actually lies. And they focus primarily on health and education. Those are kind of their yep. main two focus points. And then two smaller focuses for them is climate change and female empowerment. So those are kind of the four issues that they split their money across. And why I think they're so special is that like this amount of money is a huge responsibility, right? If you need to think about it like that, it's it's a, it's a bit stressful. If you have this amount of money, you're trying to make a difference in the world. There are every cause in the world is asking for that money, right? Everybody wants it, right? and everyone has amazing stories and emotional stories that pulling their heartstrings and Definitely. and like there's lots of emotion in in, in 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 fundraising and in charity work and these sorts of things. And so it's it's really important that we remain rational and evidence based when we think about where's this money going to be used best. We can't give it to everybody, right? There, there, there are going to be trade-offs here, and where can it be used best? And why I think yeah. the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is so powerful is that they have been focusing on the kinds of projects that governments and corporations aren't doing. Right? So instead of focusing on the same things that governments are doing with social welfare exactly. and with kind of proven strategies for alleviating poverty and trying to create jobs and whatnot, instead of focusing on things that corporations are doing for profit or non for profit, they're focusing on like leapfrog type technologies and new ideas and things that are a bit more risky but have a huge potential reward if they get it right. Right? So of that yeah. fifty three million the fifty three billion, sorry, some a lot of it will be wasted. A lot of the money will, will, will unfortunately go to projects that don't pan out. But things like um, the kind of the impact they had on malaria has been sure. incredible because it took a risk on malaria and have really made a huge dent in malaria for the world. And that's going to be Bill Gates' greatest legacy, I, I'd argue, even greater than Microsoft. Um, and that's what makes them so special is that they're finding that gap in between governments and corporations and doing what only a philanthropist can do, and that is to take risk at a huge scale because of the amount of money they have to deploy. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's an astounding amount of money. And like you said, I think this organization kind of fits in between the gaps that, you know, government are not really able to or not really um, keen on exploring. Um, and so I think this is, uh, you know, such an interesting one. Uh, and I completely agree that his, you know, philanthropic endeavors um, will, will certainly overshadow the kind of technological ones um, of the past. In terms of this, the example that this sets for future billionaires, I don't you think these are pretty big shoes to fill? Definitely. But I think it's the right kind of example to set, right? Hopefully this is going to become the precedent. And people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and whatnot, when they retire one day with these massive personal fortunes, that these fortunes get redirected to causes that actually matter and don't just become family wealth or don't just become inherited into the companies themselves. So hopefully this is the start of a brand new generation of philanthropy where technologists and people who think carefully about innovation, who are willing to invest in new technology and new R&D, are able to take that money and put it to use because that's what's going to drive the world forward, right? And this kind of long-term thinking of investing in some more risky bets that have, could have potential huge upsides, that's exactly what these technologists do on a daily basis. So they're perfectly suited to this kind of work. And so hopefully this is the first of many. And so when these guys retire from the Amazons and Apples and Googles and all these good things, that they actually take a leaf out of Bill Gates' book and uh, do as much good as, as, as Bill and Melinda actually are. Well, yeah, let's hope indeed. I mean, in terms of the contents of this letter, I don't think we've actually mentioned it yet. I mean, what, what, are, the, what are the sort of things on their mind uh, for 2020? Yeah, so 2020, they actually, they don't have many changes to their philosophy. They still see a lot of impact in, in the world of malaria, specifically in Africa. Uh, things like vaccines, they're very big on vaccines. So going into African countries which don't have... Um, like traditional medical systems and helping vaccinate people, they've made a huge dent on infant mortality in Africa. Right. So guy, uh, kids dying under the age of five, they have a huge impact there simply by getting the vaccines to the people in these rural areas. Right. And so all that is, is logistics, right? We've already figured it out. We know the vaccines. We know they work. They're cheap enough. It's just a matter of logistics of getting it there. 
and actually having someone who cares, right? So having someone who can go and find a rural village in Sudan and go and give these vaccines to these kids gives them a chance at life. So that's kind of the major focus for them. Um, malaria bed nets is a, is, a, is a stable thing there. It's a, it's a cheap way of, of solving a lot of uh, malaria type infections and just preventing it in the first place, sorry. And that's very important for helping with, with, with um, reducing malaria. In the education space, they're doing a lot of stuff in the U.S. with public school education. So uh, there's obviously this huge elite part of the education in the U.S. with the elite universities and elite yeah. private schools. But a lot of the public schools, in especially the areas that are less look less looked after, and the kind of the ghettos and some of the, the, the those kind of areas are really struggling. So there's a lot of money going into pr public school education, um, and then back into the health um, sector as well. They spoke about sanitation a lot. So thinking about in countries that have very poor sanitation, there's huge outbreaks of things like cholera and various diseases and just general bad health. And so sanitation is an unsexy thing that no one wants, no one, no corporation wants to deal with sanitation. Yeah. Governments struggle to deal with it because it's on such a mass scale. Um, and so it's a perfect opportunity for someone to take a non-sexy topic, but a topic that's very important and uh, improve that kind of infrastructure in these rural areas. And so, yeah, not, not many changes from their philosophy perspective. It's just a matter of doing more and more and more and acknowledging the fact that they think they've found the causes that matter most at the moment. Well, fascinating. I mean, if we look at, like you kind of mentioned, that divide between the public and private um, education system, I think we could kind of look at similar divides in medicine. And this, I suppose, is, is, is why I'm quite interested by this. So when they do come across a new invention in, in the medical field, in terms of rolling it out, in terms of the, the distributor, they're obviously not handing this patent over to one of the big uh, pharmaceutical companies who are basically just going to make it inaccessible. How do they hold on to it? How do they make sure that they control how it's being produced? Because we've seen far too many times where there is a drug that can make a difference and people just can't afford to buy it. Yeah, that, that is the beauty of having the amount of scale and influence that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has, right? So just because of the, the amount of influence they have, they have the ability to choose their healthcare providers wisely and choose their drug manufacturers wisely. And they're not beholden to anybody because they have the resources to actually take care of this sort of thing. And so like you say, they care very much about the idea of open sourcing this information and getting this out to everybody around the world, not just the elite in first world countries. And uh, right. so what, while the R&D often starts with the elite, because that's where the money is and that's how they get the, uh, that's how they find these new things, um, they're very focused about the logistics of getting that to the average person in the street and the average person in a rural area. Um, and so I think it's the, the scale at which they're operating is what makes them powerful. They're not just a random person tr trying to like, campaign for one cause. They have a huge influence over the medical society across the world just because of the amount of money they have to deploy and the fact that they are the gates, right? The fact they have that reputation behind yep. their name. Um, and so it's more than just the money. It's the fact that Bill Gates is getting behind this as one of like, the leading figures of the 21st century. Well, let's hope 2020 is a year of much innovation. Let's move on to our next insert. Looking ahead. Right, so let's look ahead a little bit. Um, and in this case, let's look ahead 15 years. The UK are looking to implement a ban for petrol and diesel vehicles. Now, most interestingly for me, this includes hybrids. Um, obviously, we've seen the rise of you know electric, all electric vehicles um, across the globe, really. And certainly in the UK, I've I've definitely seen a lot more sort of charging points. Um, having lived in you know a pretty decent area um, in the last, but I've definitely seen loads of garages filled up with Teslas and you know extension cords running from from the inside to to charge these things up. But do we think 15 years time is too soon, or uh, you know? Are we actually able to handle this type of ban? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure exactly how real, realistic it is, but I'm glad to see this kind of move. Um, it's, it's one of those things where you need bold action to actually make a difference, right? We've spoken about climate change being such a big issue. It needs bold action. And I think that capitalism and kind of the markets have a way of finding solutions. If you give this deadline, hopefully the industry is going to evolve and the electric car industry is going to come into its own. And uh, the whole infrastructure around that industry will grow because people understand what's coming. So I, I, I'm actually a fan of these kind of lines in the sand where we just pick a date yeah. and we say, cool, we're going to fix things, we're going to sort things out, and we're going to change. Um, because without these lines in the sand, without these regulations or these kind of um, laws put in place, 
people can kind of meander along and meander and change slowly and kind of fight things along the way, as opposed to saying, no, we're not going to stand for this anymore. Um, and so I think it's a good sign. I, I, I don't know if it's realistic, but I think it's a good good move from, the, from Great Britain. Yeah, I mean, in terms of London specifically, they, they certainly are looking to push people away from having cars at all. So I've, I've definitely seen that in their messaging. Um, but yeah, let's see what happens in the future. In terms of the next one, um, this is something that uh, the majority of our listeners will be keen to know. Uh, like we've said before, the majority of our listeners listen on Apple Podcasts or actually even on uh, Apple devices at least. Um, and this is essentially a, a bit of action coming from what happened in 2017 where we saw all of those um, accusations of Apple deliberately slowing down all the devices um, you know, whether that is to entice you to purchase a new one or whether that is for their, what they're saying um, is, you know, to help your experience in terms of protecting the battery life. Um, and regardless of, of which one of the two it actually was, um, they've now been fined 25 million euros in France. What do you think? I think it's great. I think it's great. I think that this this kind of planned technological obsolescence where they force you to buy new devices is, is terrible. And it really is not good for the consumer markets. I understand why Apple does it because they have such a loyal fan base that of course you're going to go and buy the new one because the old one is slow and doesn't run the apps like, you used, like it used to. But it's the fact that they were doing it on purpose and uh, they, they claim that they were trying to save your battery and yada, yada, yada. But I think that at the end of the day, it's pretty clear that they were trying to push you away from the older devices into the newer ones. Um, and we have, to, we have to get to a stage as a society where it's okay to have a phone for more than a year or more than two years, right? We, we have to get away from this idea we have to recycle it all the time. Um, phones haven't changed that much in the last four or five years, right? Other than extra cameras every year. Um, but the actual, actual phone itself, the, the, the use cases haven't changed dramatically. And so there's no, there's no reason that an old phone shouldn't work. You, you shouldn't be forced to have to rebuy year after year after year. So it, it's, a, it's a tiny fine when you look at Apple's cash. So it's, I don't know if it's Definitely. even going to move the needle for them. <laughs> um, but at least it's some sort of um, re retribution for what they did. Yeah, I think if the fine can just serve as kind of a headline that actually brings about a further underlying undertone, sort of extra messaging from from their you know user base, um, that that these kinds of dealings are actually just not acceptable. And uh, I mean, what they've done since then is added this battery health feature into the settings menu. If you didn't know about it, go and dig around there. Um, that's where you can kind of check. Um, you know, how your battery's doing. And, and they also had a bit of a battery replacement program and all those kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, again, uh, the sort of theme of this episode, I suppose, is uh, being held to account and uh, suffering the consequences. So glad to see that happen as well. Let's move on to our next insert. Develop and grow. All right, so for develop and grow, um, this idea comes from a blog post that I read a few days ago, which I thought might be interesting to chat about. And it's about something we don't often like to talk about. It's about when we make mistakes. And we all do it, right? We all, we all do stupid things, things that we regret, and um, things that are out of character, things that happen when we're not in the best of moods, or, or there's various mistakes we make in life. And uh, with those mistakes comes the guilt of knowing that we made a mistake. Right. So as long as you're not a psychopath, when you make a mistake, you, you feel something of, 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 of guilt, especially if it's to someone who you care about, someone you love, etc. And those regrets and that guilt can be quite damaging to somebody if you don't deal with it. Right. So if you don't apologize, if you don't make good on those, on those regrets, if you don't kind of fix whatever was broken, um, it can kind of hang on you and, and keep mental RAM in your brain and really like impact on your emotional health. And so this blog post comes from a writer called Mark Manson. And basically what he chats about is the fact that these regrets will fill us with guilt until we are able to pull some sort of positive learning from the experience, right? So obviously once you've, once you've apologized and you've made good on that promise, you need to do some soul searching and some introspection to find out why you did that and how can you try and avoid that mistake in the future. And by doing that, by pulling that kind of learning into your presence, that helps to solve and kind of like mediate some of the, the guilt in your mind and really helps you move forward as a human being. And that's how we learn as human beings, right? We make a mistake and then we figure out why do we make the mistake? How do we avoid it in the, in the future? And does it make us a better person? And so I, one of the quotes that I really loved that I wanted to read here was, developing a habit of learning from our failures is like the magical elixir that transmutes all of the embarrassing, cringy things of our lives into making us better right? So everything we do wrong that we cringe about, that we wish we didn't do, 
there's a lesson in there for us. And if we're able to pull that positive lesson from it, um, you can actually become a better person and move forward and actually become better than you were. Um, so the way you move forward is not by ignoring that guilt or by rationalizing why you did what you did. It's by actually acknowledging it, by accepting that mistake, by understanding why you acted that way and integrating yeah. that life experience into who you are today. And until you integrate that life experience, nothing actually changes. Even though you've apologized, that guilt still sits in the back of your mind and it's a regret you're going to carry for as long as you carry it. But if you're able to change that mindset and think about it as a learning experience, that's how you actually take that mistake on board and move forward as a human being. Do you have any thoughts, Chad? Yeah, I mean, mistakes are such a huge part of who we are. They're such a huge part of, of how we you know, learn and, and, and how we make progress in life. A lot of youngsters um, you know, think they can kind of just take the wisdom of their elders and, and skip through some mistakes that, that they've made. But all of us need to go through our own. Um, and, and, and that's kind of how we make our own mark. That's kind of how we you know, uh, direct where we're going. I've heard of Mark Manson before. I've actually read one of his books. Believe it or not, I finished it, but it was um, you know, sort of two <laughs> years ago. And it was actually, it was a good book. I, I did enjoy it. Um, but part of me wonders if it's got its sort of high acclaim because of the fact that he used a, a not so um, PC title. Uh, do you know the book I'm talking of? Have you read it? I do. I do. He's actually written two books with the F word in the title. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's very clearly a marketing tactic. It, it works incredibly well because when you walk into a bookshop, that's the one that catches your eye because it's so <laughs> taboo and it's, it's so off yeah. topic, right? So it's a brilliant marketing strategy. I think that I, I'm a huge fan of him. I've been reading his blog for probably 10 years now, so well, be, well wow. before he even wrote books. And yeah. I'm a huge fan of the way he thinks. So I, I think it's worth digging beyond just the hype around his books. Um, what I really love about him is that he, he writes self-help type stuff but with a very, very pessimistic view and a very yeah. reasonable, realist view on life, um, yeah. as opposed to saying, you can do everything, you can take over the world, etc. <laughs> and that's great sometimes, you need that motivation sometimes, but he is very, very practical and very down to earth. Um, and so I enjoy that contrast. And so I think it's worth going to read if, if, if this is your kind of thing. Um, and he's, both these books are really good. Yeah, I definitely didn't know about his uh, blog, so I'll have to do a little sign up there. Um, I did sign up to uh, Barry's blog, and I've sort of enjoyed reading the the past two weeks' worth of posts. Um, so, yeah, certainly uh, give Barry a little subscribe there if, if you haven't yet, um, certainly just to see what he's up to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree there. I, I think some of the some of the reason why that, that book's been so, so successful was because of the title, but there were some, some cool little gems there. Um, I, I suppose the, the core crux of it being... You need to decide what it is that you care about most and ultimately direct all your attention to those priorities. Um, and although basic things like these, um, like this post on regrets and, and on mistakes, um, it's basic stuff, but a lot of the times we do swing over them. Um, and so books like these and posts like these just kind of get you to get back to basics again um, and, and, and ultimately give a bit of perspective um, on some of the things that we're getting wrong. Without a doubt, it's, it's a good reminder for us that we can always be improving ourselves. And uh, the more we, more we listen to these things, the more we read about it, the better we can implement it into our daily lives. And hopefully it goes beyond just listening to it or reading it. Hopefully it actually turns into action. And yeah. that maybe after this episode, maybe you think about a mistake you made in the past that maybe you haven't quite internalized yet or you haven't quite worked through yet. How can you find the positive learning from that and become a better person? And if one person does that, then, then the segment's worth it. Absolutely. And ultimately, the important thing here is, like you said, I think you need to spend that time to do a bit of reflecting. It's all very well to have all of this knowledge about you know, how we can actually improve ourselves, how we can you know, get to these deeper insights. But if we don't just sit alone and, and actually maybe even just brainstorm, maybe even do a little timeline of your life, the, the biggest things you can remember and, and kind of uh, do, that, do that actual thinking. Um, ultimately, it's all pointless. Um, so completely agree with you there. Let's move on to a question from our listeners. What's on your mind? Alrighty, so we're going to move on to a question from our listener today. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a voice note of this one, uh, but a definitely a good question indeed. So let me quickly read it out. This is from Craig. Thanks for the question, Craig. What's the value of having a university degree in this day and age when corporates like Tesla and Google are hiring people without them? Is there a need for this day and age uh, for everyone to attend a traditional university? Certainly an interesting topic. Um, what are your thoughts, Barry? 
Yeah, it's 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 an interesting debate, and it's it's really been raging over the last couple couple of months. Um, I think the reason this kind of question came out was Tesla recently announced, or Elon on Twitter announced that he's hiring a bunch of engineers for the Tesla AI team, and so obviously it's one of the most exciting teams in the world. Like they're looking for super smart people, but he said he didn't even care about high school. He wanted to see projects that you had done in AI. So he wasn't looking for Harvard degrees. He wasn't looking for even high school diplomas. He was looking for skills. And uh, it's kind of a change in the way these big companies are looking at how they hire. Um, I think that the value of a university education has come under increasing threat over the last little bit because it's exceedingly expensive in a lot of cases. And yep. it's simply not translating into the types of skills that are relevant in today's world. A lot of the curriculums and a lot of the syllabuses are still like old syllabi. And they are teaching things that are out of date very, very quickly. And so if you're able to prove that you can do the thing, so you can do the work, you can code, you can have those skills that are needed, maybe that theoretical understanding from university isn't as important. I certainly think that's the case. I think that for certain things, I would like people to go to university. So like I would like my doctors to go through all the years of work to become sure. a doctor, right? Yeah. But when you're thinking of things like tech or things like the humanities or various other fields, I actually think that it's more important to have practiced it and actually have to show in some sort of body of work. Why I think sharing things online is so important to me is the fact that I'm trying to show that I've mastered certain skills because yeah. I think that's more important than my university degree, which is a piece of paper at the end of the day. And uh, I think that that kind of project-based learning is going to become more and more of the trend. I think that university educations are a lot of a lot of them are just status symbols at this stage, right? To be able to say that I went to a prestigious university is just a status symbol. Yeah. And uh, if everyone's coming out of that degree and all coming out with honors degrees and going into the marketplace, how do you differentiate those people? If they're all coming from the same background, they've been taught to think the same way, et cetera, et cetera. What these companies are realizing is that they can actually look at, do it for me. Like, take a project, work on it for a month, and come back to me, and then I'll see how good you actually are rather than trying to take a standardized test that tries to approximate what the world is looking for. Um, and so I think it's a trend we're going to see continue, and I hope it continues. I think the universities are going to become less and less relevant unless they change the way they think about education. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think they have a role in society, definitely, but they have to change the way they think about it. What are your thoughts, Chad? Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. I think it's a change that uh, is overdue, really. I, I'm, I'm quite happy to see it come by. I mean... I'm sure you've come across a couple of people in your sort of studying career where, you know, you get people who are book smart, um, but in the real world, you know, just kind of don't have the skills to match. And so I think a, an approach like this is, is certainly one that um, exposes that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, like you said, a lot of this material is, is dated, um, especially if you look at the field of, of IT, even just to spend the time to put together some coursework um, that will be presented in a year or two's time once you've curated and, you know, actually filtered down everything that is in there, it's already irrelevant. Um, so things like, you know, your project, like your 100 days of code, uh, which actually ultimately puts the burden on you to say, well, hey, there's a whole bunch of material out there. Um, there's literally a, a whole community of people who are sharing new things all of the time. And you essentially get to decide on which looks like it'll teach you the most amount of skills uh, at skills that you're interested in another Im important thing a lot of the time these courses are you know fairly fairly wide ranging and cover wide bunches of topics and there's so many options today there's so many niches um, and i think people need to specialize a little bit more on the things that they uh, that interests them um, and kind of just filter out the stuff that they need just to get credits for don't you agree I agree completely. And I think what's important to recognize as well is, is the impact that corporations can have in this debate, right? So in a lot of jobs today, we kind of go to university because we think that it's needed to get a job. Whereas if yeah. these big companies come out and, and, and say to us bluntly that we don't care about your university education, it gives us more confidence that we can take the, the uncertain route and, and try something different. Um, if, if, if everyone is operating under the idea that you need a university degree to become a certain thing, then you're forced to do it, even if you don't want to go to university. You're forced to because yeah. that's, that's the prerequisites. <coughs> Whereas the moment these big companies start to st stand up and say, no, we're changing the way we think, it will, in effort, in actually change the way the university is run because the demand and supply will change. So I think it's a key, key insight. The only thing that I'm sort of on the other hand, sort of on the other side of the debate um, a little bit, worried about is i mean universities do have a way of of teaching you how to digest information how to learn information and, and for me i think that skill is a, is a worthwhile one 
Um, not sure if that's just me, um, but you know, I certainly felt uh, de- myself developing methodologies to to learn and, and retain information um, at my time in university, um, and I I wouldn't want anyone to miss out on that though. Yeah, I, I, I think I actually disagree with you there, Chad. And maybe it's just my own a- anecdotal experience from Vitz. But I, I felt that a lot of the teaching actually wasn't teaching me how to think or how to reason or how to think critically. A lot of it was teaching me how to regurgitate facts or how to just repeat processes. And um, so while I did pick up certain things, and I think university is great for teaching you to work hard and kind of some of, sure. the, some of the knowledge acquisition skills, I think that actual courses on how to learn or how to study would be a lot more valuable than a random elective that I did because I needed the full credit, sure. for example. Sure. So, so I, I think what you're speaking about is things you might have learned in the process of learning your actual Definitely. subjects. But maybe yep. we should be thinking about the fact that those courses of how to learn, how to study, those meta skills that can be applied across the range to all sorts of things, maybe that's where university can step in and try and help people understand how to acquire knowledge and then let them go down the rabbit hole of what they are interested in, find the niche for them, but applying the tools they learn in university. So I think university needs to be a tool-based learning thing rather than just yep. shoving facts down my throat. Um, teach me the tools, help me understand how to move forward in the world, what skills are relevant and then let the internet and project-based work fill the rest does that make sense that makes complete sense and uh, it's a useful way of keeping the organizations relevant obviously they're not going to be too keen to give up all their courses and, and you know lose out on all the students um, but maybe we can make it a little bit more accessible to more students ultimately you know supply and demand uh, increase the admission criteria and really just have it more for like you said, to pick up that toolkit um, and, you know, where we actually do the sort of meaningful development is, is more sort of on our own terms. Um, and it comes to a stage where instead of us, you know, being stuck to a two page CV because that's the norm and people are, you know, people don't like reading more than that. Um, you know, that sort of messaging also starts to change where your CV becomes a lot more about you, your skills, what the, the actual particulars that you've done rather than putting a one line accredited degree which you know should ultimately um come across it with some generic skills that everyone else has definitely i i think it's 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 a trend we're going to continue to watch as as time goes on and uh, we'll see if universities are able to be agile and flexible and change the way they think or are they going to become those those old institutions that are unwilling to change absolutely definitely agree there well, I think we've come to the end of our episode, Barry. Um, this one, I think, shorter than our last ones. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. I, I think it is a little bit shorter. Um, I think that no matter how many stories we take, there's so much to chat about and there's so much depth in these things. And uh, so we don't, we don't want to cut things short just for the sake of it. We want to chat about all the various issues that we think are relevant. And so hopefully you found something valuable in this. Um, I certainly found a lot valuable from this. Um, I learned so much from these, these experiments. And so long may they continue and uh, hopefully you enjoy listening to them. Absolutely. Well, as always, please do subscribe on any platform. Check out our Facebook page as well if you haven't yet. Um, And yeah, we'll see you next week. I'm Chad Sturley from London. On the other side, that's Barry Maurice in Johannesburg. And this was episode 14 of Across the Pond. I'm nice and pink. I'm pink, da 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 What a good song, eh? What uh, a banger. Oh, tune. Blast from the past is, uh, you know, held back is, is not sort of as, as uh, sorry, let me start this again. Moving on to our next, <coughs> moving on to our, <coughs> oh, this one. I hope, I hope this episode is going to be good. <coughs> <laughs> I very, yeah, <laughs> okay. It looks like this day is now finally coming. Um, I mean, w- w- <laughs> what was my question? Pond. And uh, yeah, basically this past... Ooh, sorry, let me move my camera. I knocked it with my foot. Geographic, ge- ge- geological, no, <laughs> geographical things. Let me start again. <laughs> um, <laughs> ge- what's geographical? Is that the right word? Um, that, you know, try and... That try and actually... <laughs> And really just messaging develops over time. Um, add something new, Chad. Add something new. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to continue? And then the second big piece of, of kind of... Oh. <laughs> oh, it's like we always have a good, a good... It's always a good episode followed by a bad. 
I don't know what it is. <laughs> open to diverse films and open to diverse kind of um, looking at these films. Oh. <laughs> 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 During the acceptance speech, um, there was, th- they essentially, I heard. <coughs> cool, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> You're live. Get some progress there. The other interesting thought that I had, um, if in terms, okay, sorry, sorry, I was going to change the, I was going to change the topic completely. So let me go back. Being spent on these causes, I'm just repeating myself. <coughs> Um, in terms of, you know, his relevance, uh, I don't know what to ask. I don't know what new stuff to add. This is my problem. So I've got something, so I can jump in if you need. Um, I'm, uh, oh, by the way, in terms of rolling it out, in terms of their distributor, private people as well to come in. And so I'm just repeating what you said again. This is what we're trying to avoid. <coughs> um, Brain. That's... M- 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 <laughs> Those things remain regrets or they remain guilt free. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so this broke up. <laughs> what is happening? Maybe we should just stop this stop recording because I I've li- I've literally made ten times more errors than I make and I normally make too many errors anyway. Why I'm so pu- why I'm so like um why I'm so <laughs> Why? Why I think? Sorry, I think I disagree with you there, Chad. I think I think that I've been I was disappointed by. Um, <laughs> shit. I'm so excited! I got a disagreement. <laughs> 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 um, okay. 